All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think we are now live uh, and hoping that many of you are out there. Uh, my name is Sean Coughlin, and I'm going to try and moderate this panel as we review recap of virtual proceedings uh, during the past year or two, whether they be before FINRA arbitrations, regulators, or civil proceedings. Uh, today, our panel includes Rick Berry, uh, Paige Persky, Janice Malecki, Ronick Patel, and Joe Calabres. Uh, Rick, of course, is the director of FINRA's Dispute Resolution Services. I think many of you who practiced before the FINRA arbitration panels know him. Uh, Paige and Janice are both uh, plaintiffs slash um, claimants counsel and are very active in both FINRA and civil proceedings. Ronix, one of my Texas partners, he's a former regulator who's now representing financial services institutions and advising them on regulatory matters and crypto matters. And Joe Calabrese and I have a remarkable similar background. We were both uh, assistant DAs in Brooklyn for a period of time and both in-house at Smith Barney Morgan Stanley. And now we're uh, both here at Bressler. And we're gonna strive today to review what we've learned as we enter the third year of this new virtual world. So we can skip past our beautiful pictures that are up there and get into what FINRA's response to COVID has been. Rick, why don't you go through um, some of the, the numbers that have really gone on as we've uh, entered into the third year of COVID? Sure. Well, believe it or not, we have had at FINRA over 800 cases with one or more Zoom hearings on the merits. And this divides uh, up into 341 customer cases and 461 industry cases. And you know, Zoom is still going strong. When we looked at our customer uh, awards through April, uh, 43 of those were by Zoom and 19 were in person. Um, that's 69% of the cases that went to award in the customer area this year were by Zoom, only 31 in person. That'll probably change as we move forward this year, but I thought that was surprising. And then you may have seen some studies that said, oh, Zoom isn't working out for the customers. And our data on the website um, shows that that's not true. Uh, customers are taking, uh, are getting damages in 42% of the cases that closed this year uh, by Zoom and 37% of those in person. So they're performing, a they're, they're, the results are a little bit better for claimants on um, Zoom proceedings. That's right. And that's been consistent all year. And do you have any thoughts about where Zoom's going to be as we get into less of a COVID world and we're allowed to get together? Sure. You know, one of the things, when you run a program like FINRA Arbitration, you have to constantly be listening so um, we're always looking for feedback and looking to continuously improve. And so we've been getting feedback from lots of sources and trying to make improvements to the, to the Zoom offerings we make. Obviously we have our advisory committee, which is the National Arbitration Mediation Committee, seven public members, six industry members. Um, and we were hearing from them like, wow, this Zoom, we really like it. We're gonna use it for, uh, more often than we expected. Um, we're going to use it for expungement cases. We're going to use it in, a, in what we call a hybrid fashion where most things are in person, but a bunch of witnesses will uh, join in by, by Zoom. We're not going to see people flown across the country for 30 minutes of testimony anymore. So hearing that from our advisory committee, we decided we really wanted to get more information. So we created a Zoom task force. And the Zoom task force has four public, four industry members, and really helped us uh, shape our offerings. We put out a survey through the Zoom task force asking arbitrators their experience and parties and counsel their experience. And we got some really great uh, results from that. Uh, satisfaction with the Zoom platform, arbitrators said 91% was exceptional or good. Now keep in mind when we asked counsel and parties, they'd already got their awards. So their numbers were bound to be lower and they were 74% of counsel and parties said exceptional or good. Um, we also asked, hey, what would you think if we moved our pre-hearing conferences to Zoom video instead of a telephone? And 
you probably know that no one uses the phone anymore. It's just like a dying thing. So um, they were very strong in favor of moving forward with some um, use of Zoom video um, for initial pre-hearing conferences. Arbitrators said 75%, yes, we want, we want Zoom video. Hardy said 77%. For discovery, arbitrators said 80%, yes, we want Zoom video. Hardy's 83%. And for other pre-hearings, ARB's 85%, Hardy's 86%. So one last thing and I'll stop talking. Uh, as a result of that, we are currently doing pilots where uh, in one region, all of our pre-hearing conferences are done by Zoom. In the three other regions, um, some are being done by Zoom. And we anticipate on July 1st, switching to all of our pre-hearing conferences being by Zoom, unless the parties order otherwise, I'm sorry, the parties agree otherwise or the panel orders otherwise. Well, that sounds great. Janice and Joe, can you tell us what you've thought so far about hearings that you did during the past year with a lot of the new Zoom setups, if you will, with FINRA? You guys can. You know, I, um, I would say that um, I think Zoom has a place, you know, in these FINRA proceedings. Um, I'm not sure it's perfect for every case. Um, I think that there, from a claimant's perspective, and despite whatever the statistics may be, there may be some cases where you want personal interaction and in-person, um, you know, connections between the arbitrators and the customer, particularly in, you know, certain types of cases. Um, so, so, so I, you know, I, I think it's a really useful tool. Um, I think that it should definitely continue. Um, but I think, I think that we should look, look towards more hybrid type hearings. Um, so, you know, that's what I'd say generally in terms of my take on it. What do you think, Joe? I, I find myself agreeing with one of my adversaries, which doesn't happen very often. Uh, I, I'm 50-50 on this technology. Uh, I like the fact that we don't have to fly people across the country for 15 minutes, uh, just like Rick was talking about. On the other hand, I think that this technology, although it makes life easier for a lot of us, you know, the convenience of sitting in our offices as, as to having to fly someplace or even to fight our way through downtown to get to Fimmer's offices is great. But there's, a, there's something you can't argue with. And one of it is the disconnect between parties on using this technology. Um, I think anybody who tries cases for a living would have to agree that cross-examining somebody through this box is not nearly as effective as literally sitting five feet away from them or three feet away from them at a table. Um, and I think the same is for direct examinations. You know, a lot of times you want direct examination, and, and this is what I teach my students um, in trial ad classes, you want a direct examination to be a conversation. You want it to be a very simple back and forth. So the panel has an opportunity or the jury has an opportunity to sit back and really just look at that witness, engage their credibility. It's very difficult to do that on Zoom. We step over each other constantly. There's a bit of a delay. Getting, uh, while I love putting evidence up on the screen because I think panels really um, enjoy being able to look at what I'm talking about without having to flip pages. Sometimes that gets in the way of the, I can't make eye contact with somebody while, while I'm doing that. So I agree, and I'm not gonna fight it because I'm gonna lose, that the, um, the technology is here to stay. Uh, I, I would rather panels not get comfortable with the fact that this is gonna be 100% of the time because I think it does our respective clients the disservice. I don't know why claimants are recovering a little bit more um, using Zoom. Candidly, I don't think that has anything to do with the technology. Um, I think that it, that has to do with the way panels are looking at some of these cases in a, in a very up market where there aren't that many of them. But, that, but that's for another day. So um, <clears throat> I have my reservations about it, uh, but, but where we can cooperate, we, where we can get things done more efficiently, I'm all, I'm all for it. And, and Paige, as we talk about the these virtual proceedings, why don't you give us your thoughts as a as a civil as a civil a plaintiff's lawyer the pluses and minuses that you see? Sure. So we have been doing um, primarily depositions over Zoom, which has worked, I think, fantastically. Um, it 
save so much money and time to be able to do them that way. Um, and I think it's, it's perfect for that, for experts, for witnesses. We've been able to work out deposition protocols so that we deliver documents somewhere between 24 or 48 hours ahead of time. So they actually have the hard copies there. Um, so for that portion of it, I think it's worked really well. For trials, I think it's, it's a lot like arbitration. I think the hybrid works pretty well. Having a few witnesses remote really seems to be very helpful and can accommodate witnesses. Um, but trying to do the whole thing via Zoom, I think would be very, very difficult. And uh, you kind of lose a lot. And, and, and we've also kind of found that some judges are much more open to the idea of using Zoom at all than, than some others. Some are really still hesitant to use it at all in, in an actual final trial. Ronick, what, what's been your experience over the last year, year and a half with regulatory proceedings? Um, yeah, no, Sean. So we've seen regulators, you know, continue to use uh, virtual me mechanisms for collecting information, whether it's formally or informally as part of the investigatory process, as well as uh, having to uh, use the administrative hearing processes that uh, involve virtual hearings, similar to, you know, whether it's Zoom or WebEx, or whatever the agency or, or state or, uh, or jurisdiction uses. Um, there's been a fair bit of that, but mainly we've seen it really on the investigative side and, and uh, a relative distaste for virtual proceedings from the regulators, at least in my cases, uh, in, in, in wanting to take the board without, uh, without waiting to see where we can get to with an in-person hearing. That's sort of been the kind of my experience over the last two years is they're not keen for it. Um, not super well equipped for it uh, in a lot of cases, um, and that's not across the board. Some some regulators, obviously, you know, have done a great job of being fully fully prepared and technologically and and training wise on it. But um, I've seen it being used a lot more on the investigatory side, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So I I think what we try to do was put together some takeaways for everybody to consider, and there are four of them. And uh, they are, one, these virtual hearings are here to stay. You know, we heard from Rick before, this, this is gonna be used consistently. Um, we're gonna see a consistent and significant increase in virtual de depositions, arbitrations, and, and really, frankly, other proceedings. Um, and I think people need to get used to it. Three, the medium is the message. So I think, and we're gonna talk about this, we all have to agree and realize that how you're coming across on a computer screen, TV screen, or whatever is really different than how we used to come across when we were in a courtroom. And then four, we've got to adjust for this new medium. And, and part of that is when you're doing a hybrid case, you've got to have in some ways your, your virtual brain on for certain witnesses and turn on that courtroom presence for those other witnesses. So with that in mind, we're going to talk then about controlling the proceeding. And I thought I'd go to Janice to get started here because having tried cases against her in the past, I can assure everybody out there, this is a, an adversary who knows how to control proceedings. So tell us what you think about how evidence is presented in this new form, Janice. So, you know, evidence, it, there's this really a lot of pluses and minuses here, right? So I agree with Joe that, you know, there's some sort of dialogue you want to have with your client in a direct uh, examination. And with this sort of passive, you know, arbitrators can take a very passive brain approach to watching a hearing on a screen versus being physically in a room with people, right? So you have to do things that are going to engage them to make them sit up and actually be more active in the process. And, and so I think one thing you need to do is to check in with them periodically so that they have to interact with you and interact and have breaks and things like that. Um, because otherwise they get into a passive brain. But with respect to like a cross-examination, it could be very helpful to do it on Zoom because of the following. You know, I, I did a, I did three very large hearings during Zoom, um, and um, 
I was able, it had a lot of documents. We had um, language interpreters. We had simultaneous language interpreters, by the way, court reporters. We had like people in different time zones in different countries. It was, it was really, uh, they were very interesting cases. But with cross-examination, the thing that was very effective for me was I'd opened my Adobe Acrobat and before the hearing, as I'm preparing, and you know, I don't really have outlines, I have outlines, not really questions ready, but you know, I usually go off the documents on a certain sequence that I know, right? And so I have them all lined up one next to the other, right? And so I can rip through a cross-examination um, in a way that could be very compelling. And I know there was like certain forgeries, so you could show documents next to each other on the screen simultaneously. Um, and it was very easy. I could have that, and I had that set up on a screen already. So there was a lot, not a lot of downtime, and I was able to really control the witness and the proceedings. It was very hard for people to interrupt because it was all set up and ready. So, you know, in that way, it's good. You know, the downside is it's harder to see the witness sweat on a TV screen, right? <laughs> so, you know, there's that problem. And, you know, the way the Zoom screen is set up, I would love it if they could change it for court proceedings and FINRA arbitrations to make it more uh, trial-like where people are organized in a certain way on the screen. But, um, you know, you can't really sort of get that emotional, uh, you know, you know, especially as a woman, I can't be have to make sure I'm not shrill. How is that going to come across on somebody's, you know, screen? And so you have to be, uh, you have to be a little bit more measured than, you know, you might be a little more sassy, let's say, in person than you can necessarily be on a Zoom. And so, um, you know, so the control of the proceedings from my perspective is the organization that comes before it so that it can just fall in line. Um, and then, and, and that is actually kind of fun, you know, <laughs> when you when you get going and you're on a roll and you have everything set up and there's no fluffing with papers and everything, you know, there may be certain times though that you say, you know, you want, to, you want the, the panel to really interact with the document and say, look, I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I really would like you to take this out because I think you're going to want to take notes on this document, you know, so I'm giving them a little prompt to engage them to make sure that they're not like sort of, you know, I mean, I had, I had a hearing where one of the, one of the arbitrators wore those dark black glasses that go all the way around your head. I couldn't tell if he was paying attention or not, and he refused to pick up a book, you know? So, you know, I, I was, I kind of made them pick up books and I was, I, you know, I, I directed them where to go at certain times. So I, I called out certain documents in that way. So, you know, it can be effective. What do you think, Joe? I think controlling the proceeding is really difficult, <clears throat> especially um, when you're defending across examinations. I, I felt what Janice was is very interesting about she's cross-examining somebody she's ripping through things she's got a rhythm and of course what do i want to do when that's happening i need to put a stop to it, <laughs> right i need to object and objecting and objecting on zoom is becomes an act of futility some days where normally in the real world if you're in the same room together and you say objection usually your adversary out of respect will stop talking normally right um or an arbitrator will interrupt them on Zoom, there's that delay. So Janice is up there slaughtering a witness, right? And I try to get in the way. And there are times where if my voice crosses over hers, hers wins. And that's just the technology. I might be louder than everybody in the room. The technology has finally fixed the problem with me. I'm no longer the loudest person in the room. So now I'm objecting. Nobody hears that there's a delay. If the chairperson or of the panel is lucky enough to hear it, Look, arbitrators don't like objections. They don't like stopping things. They don't like ruling. I think that's a fact of life. We're not in court. Judges are different mentally. So if they're already not willing to get in the way, when they kind of pretend nobody heard you, they're less willing to get in the way and they're hoping everyone will stop. Um, and I find it sometimes very difficult to, to get an objection to stop something that I think is improper. Uh, very short war story what happened to me. We, we did a lot of backlog 
querying uh, the, sec, uh, the third and fourth quarter of last year. I tried about three or four cases. All of them um, were virtual. And there was, a, there was a technology gap between the microphone in our conference room and what was going on in Zoom. And so while we could hear each other, Zoom, FINRA couldn't hear us, and none of us were on mute. I, and uh, one of my adversaries did the old presumed fact, not in evidence, and started summing up during a question that made it sound like fact. So I objected, and everyone kept talking. And I kept objecting again because now they were listening to what he was saying. I found myself with a, a complete lack of dignity, waving at the screen, trying to get someone's attention that I had something to say. And then by the time someone realized that and they fixed it, damage was done. Question was answered, panel had in its mind what the what my adversary had said, and yeah, sure, you can clean that up on redirect. I mean, that's what redirect is for. Um, but I think sometimes that gap slows down the way that we can really interact. So <clears throat> one of the things that I want to do. So I was gonna go right to Rick about um, technology and arbitrators, but I wanted to interject one thing based upon what you were saying, Janice. And I have found that when you have lots of documents you want to show people, it's a great forum. But sometimes we have, you know, uh, you're an, an examination that is not so document intensive. And there I really miss the face to face interaction because it's more storytelling, if you will, or it's more contradicting whatever the account was that a witness gave, but there aren't a lot of exhibits to work with. It's more common sense. It's more, you know, what really asking questions about what happened. And I think that's where the um, Zoom format's very difficult because people expect to see something exciting and up on the screen and you really can't deliver it. Well, I think that's more a problem of screening the customer who doesn't have record keeping requirements versus a broker dealer a witness that where there's tons of regulatory documents and notes and supervision and reports and so you know i think that's uh, the nature of the beast in terms of what side you're sitting on yeah, that, that's true too so rick what are we doing um in terms of exhibits and making sure that you know arbitrators are able to manipulate the materials that are being provided to them by the parties John, that's a great question. We we uh, did a little poll of our regional staff to find out what arbitrators, this is all up to the arbitrators basically about how they want to get their exhibits. And pretty much all the regions have the same answers, that almost all the arbitrators are relying exclusively on electronic exhibits for expungement hearings. They rarely will ask for binders. Uh, there's a 50-50 split for regular hearings. And Sometimes they'll want binders, sometimes they're fine with electronic. And of course, because it's nothing simple, they also sometimes want both. Um, but I did want to make sure everyone's aware we used to have, our portal used to have a restriction that you could only send in exhibits to us um, that were PDFs. And that we had to change that as soon as um, the pandemic started because um, we were relying on electronic exhibits much more often than we had in the past. So our portal now allows you to turn in all document types through the portal, uh, which I think will be very, very helpful. Uh, again, the, the, it's up to the panel. Generally, if the parties agree, the panel will generally follow that. But um, if they don't agree, the panel will make the decision on what form they want those exhibits in. And right before we uh, get into the civil trial proceedings, I thought this would be, be a good time to talk about court reporters, something we were discussing beforehand. Um, Paige, what, what's your opinion about court reporters and Zoom proceedings? I would always get a court reporter for a Zoom proceeding. Um, I would get a court reporter and I would have access to real time. I think it's, it's one of the most important things you can do for your case. I always got them in non-Zoom hearings and I think they are equally important in Zoom hearings, if not more so. Janice, Ronick, comments? I mean, I, I love it. You know, uh, oftentimes my clients don't want to spring for a court reporter. So I love it when the other side is demanding a court reporter. And I say, well, you know, as long as you pay for it, I'm fine with that. Uh, so I do, I do like, uh, but I think it's got to be equal access to everyone, right? Like, you know, one party can't have real time, you know, feeds and the other party doesn't. The, everybody, including the arbitrators, all get the same thing. Uh, I find arbitrators really like transcripts, um, you know, and, and, 
you know, just to to follow up on documents, I want arbitrators to have transcripts if they can have physical transcripts. I want them to have physical documents. I want them to have things that they are used to having so that it becomes more of a interactive experience and not just somebody watching a screen like on television. <laughs> you know, so I, to me, the you know, anything physical, including a transcript, is really important. Ronick, what do you think? What, what's been your experience with the proceedings you've been engaging in? Well, no, and, and one of the things I was going to just add to this is, you know, question is, where's where's the court reporter located? We've had uh, cases where the court reporter is sitting with with the questioning party and, you know, we're we're answering our clients answering over Zoom and, you know, just feeling like how clear is the transmission and, and what the court reporter is getting, where are they positioned in the room? with with if they're sitting in the same place so that's something that you know i i kind of found to be um uh less helpful frankly uh where the court reporter was you know embedded with with the questioning party and and that kind of really did affect the effectiveness of the transcription to some degree and, and that's something where you know if you're going to have a court reporter in one of these that may be something that you make sure you get clear up front so that's a good point. And speaking of court reporters, I guess we can now move to you know civil trial experiences over the last uh, two years or so. Um, Paige, what's been your experience in terms of how depositions have been proceeding and the differences in a, this new forum versus in terms of prepping witnesses? Well, so yeah, I was thinking about that when Joe was talking earlier about objections. I think that it's really key that you talk to your witness before they have a deposition so that they understand the delay. Um, Cause that, that was something to sort of get used to when we first moved to these remote depositions. They don't, since you're not sitting next to them to object, they, they really do need to pause and give you a moment to get that objection out and get it on the record. Um, so I think that is important to go over with them if you're not going to be sitting with them. Um, and, and also sort of what can they have with them? What, you know, what documents can they bring? When do they open the documents they receive? All of those things, I think it's really important to spend time going through that with them and probably practicing with them a little bit on Zoom. Um, so that they have a feel for how they come across on Zoom, um, which can be important for trial as well. Uh, but since most of the depositions we're doing will ultimately be played at trial, you, you want to make sure that they're coming across in the best light. Um, it's sort of another thing that we have found very helpful is having a trial tech for all of the depositions. So they're in charge of the documents, they're rolling it up. Um, and that way, I'm not fumbling around with documents, trying to pull it up myself, which I might not do such a great job. Uh, so that that's been sort of another thing that's been very, very helpful. One of the things that I, I've thought about and think in terms of prepping for depositions is really the importance of doing that dry run with your witness in the other location and almost working through as if you're the adversary so they get the experience of what it's like and, and you really need to have a colleague with you to almost play your role so that that person can step in and, and you're all on three different cameras and you're all in three different locations um, and and like you said these tapes are going to be played at the trial later so I, I think if anything we need to put more time and effort in the prep, preparation of this than it used to be. You and I were talking before about um, defending depositions, or my experience is mostly defending depositions. I, I've been amazed at some of the depositions where uh, I've defended in the last year or so, where it almost looked like my adversary was looking at the documents the first time. And I was like, why would anybody bet it, get on camera and be that way? But it happens. Right, I've had similar experiences. I've also had uh, similar experiences with uh, defending depositions where I was actually not the one defending it, but co-counsel was defending it. So uh, they didn't realize that they had they were on mute. So I, I'm texting and saying, object, object. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing their mouth move, but nobody's hearing it. So that, that's, that's a big problem. 
and something that I think if you practice a little more, you might sort of work through. So it's practice is good for the witness and for the attorneys. And, and with that note, our first code of the day is October. October is our first code. And hopefully when we give you the second code at the end of the day, you'll understand why we're saying October. So please record October so you get some CLE credit. Um, does anybody have any opinion about uh, controlling evidence via the Zoom proceeding versus in real life? You know, I, I've done a number of SEC regulatory on the records where I have to say it's a situation where there's an investigation going on and you don't necessarily have all the documents that they have. You don't know necessarily going in what they're going to be focusing on if you don't know other witnesses that have gone in previously. And uh, your client might not have access to everything. So for the first time, your client needs to look at a 50 page document, you know, and maybe they don't need to look at the 50 pages, but they might need to look at 10 of those 50 pages or 20 of them. And I have found that the uh, procedures at places like the SEC, you know, in their enforcement unit and FINRA enforcement are not necessarily uniform throughout the country. And so some SEC investigators would email us the documents so my client could take a break and look at this 50 page document and others would say no we're going to scroll through it. So you couldn't prepare your document your client with the document you couldn't have him read it in advance because you know they want that you know this is the first time you're seeing it reaction to a document and. Uh, but some have allowed emails of it others have it and I, I found that that's very difficult made it impossible for the court reporter because there was all this go forward, go back and talking over one another. Um, and um, I, I felt like that wasn't fair to the witness because the witness also, if they lingered on a certain page or asked to go back to a certain page, which you wouldn't necessarily see if you were sitting in a room with the SEC and they're just flipping back and forth, they wouldn't be able to tell. Now you're highlighting to them Oh, I better ask them about that paragraph. They lingered on it for a long time, so so I have found that that um, that that sort of testimony has been difficult when using documents uh, in these proceedings. Uh, just let, let me interject. I've noticed a couple of people, participants, have raised hands. Uh, if you have something you want to put in the chat or at, put something in a Q and A, please go ahead, and we'll try and get to that. And you've probably also noticed if you're out there that. While Janice was talking about documents, I was able to lose the page on the power screen like nine times before I got us back to where we're supposed to be, which is talking about controlling the proceeding and, and what type of impact you're gonna get. So best laid plans are good until you get punched in the face, right? So you lost so, control of the proceeding is what you did. I, I, I did, <laughs> yes. I had to bring it back by putting myself down a little bit, laughing at myself and, and moving forward. Um, and hopefully the audience impact we got wasn't terrible there. But as you can see, I was not able to quickly manipulate the documents. Um, <laughs> so we go, oh, this is awful. I'm going the wrong way, guys. Well, well, All right, well, the regulatory proceedings, there we go. <laughs> yeah, Sean, I was, I was just gonna jump in to, to tack on to sort of what which Anise referenced regarding, you know, dealing with regulators and the documents. I mean, that's absolutely correct. I mean, one of the key problems is the regulator is going to have restrictions around what they can share. And from, and so it's, you know, unlike, unlike civil matters, the regulator is going to be subject to their confidentiality provisions. And you are subject to the letter of the law on those, but you're also somewhat stuck to um, how the, how the investigator or the enforcement attorney wants to sort of manage their process. They are in complete control as a result. And they've got this perfect excuse or reason, um, which is, hey, uh, we cannot give records from our investigation to anybody. It, even it, we can show them to you during testimony. We can show them, you know, we can present them uh, at, at a hearing, obviously, and put them into the record. But outside of that, we can't just give them to you. We can't give them to you. Uh, in, in any form or fashion ahead of time. 
Um, and that really does sort of handicap the game. And so, you know, what I like to try to do is have the conversation with the regulator up front to, to again, before, before the scheduled session to say, look, are you going to be presenting records? You know, how can we best manage this in a manner, but also to plant the seed that, um, you know, it, both with the client and the, and the regulator that look, the, if they're going to be seeing records for the first time on screen, um, that's going to be uh, something that, you know, I don't want to have read into, I guess. It, 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 we're going to advise them to take their time. We're going to have the client know that they should take their time because it is even different looking at a screen and, and feeling the pressure of these faces on, you know, looking at you on the Zoom as you're trying to read and understand a document, I think is very different than in person where they've got their hands on paper and that sort of thing. So you want to prepare them for that. Um, absolutely. From, from the regulatory proceeding side. Yeah, I think there too, it's, it's really important to have a very good dialogue with the regulators you're working with just because of that. So you can get them to, um, let you know a little bit better about what they want to focus on so that your witness is prepared to do that. And yeah, sometimes you, there, you're, there are people trying to play the quote unquote gotcha game, but if you've established a good relationship with the regulators you're working with, you can avoid a lot of that. It's just like oftentimes if I'm trying to case against uh, Janice here, you know, she and I can get together and figure out what what exhibits do we really need to get there as opposed, as opposed to the, oh, we're going to use anything and everything, right? The anything and everything does nobody any justice, but talking about what we really need, coming up with a, a book of common exhibits can really streamline things. Um, and if the regulators are really looking at an issue and you've got problems with your client, you already know that. Um, or if you've got solutions to what the, you believe the regulator is looking at, you know that too. So it's all about preparation. Um, anybody else want to comment about regulatory proceedings before we move on back and go back to FINRA? Because I figured out the next screen. Uh, one of the one of the things I, one of the points I was going to just mention uh, is enforcement proceedings um, in the regulatory context. I mean, you know, especially uh, outside of the SRO context, um, you know, with the with the state or or even a federal regulator. One of the questions I think that you should analyze or at least consider is if if a hearing is being pushed for by the regulator um, and your client has hesitancy in do you know appearing in that manner um, you, you know there might be there might be due process considerations to look at where you've got a government entity involved and and you know that's something to sort of keep in the keep in the bag as far as uh, considerations I would say if you, if you do need to strategically employ that or have that conversation again, it's, it's a real issue where if someone's rights uh, or, or uh, you know, rights are being impacted by a government entity, should they be forced to appear via Zoom? And what does that mean? So that's something that, you know, you may want to just consider if you need to ever get into that situation. I, I think that's an excellent point. I also think that comes into consideration when you're, talk, you're talking about the need for an adjournment, for example, you know, there, there's now this notion that, oh, well, it, somebody might not be available, but, oh, we can put them on camera. But this, are you really doing justice for your client if you're, you know, giving them, you know, very little notice about getting, you know, either before a regulator or before a panel where they've had some event that occurred where they're not, you know, able to be prepared, you know. Yeah. Have you had experiences with with clients who, have, because of this new format, they they they're asking to bring in witnesses who wouldn't normally testify? And certainly, uh, because because everyone's available and they're kind of available at a moment's notice, right? We don't have right. to get them on a plane or bring them in from Timbuktu. So, absolutely, seeing that, um, which which adds a lot of wrinkles. Um, I think also. The, uh, the due process issue really is a real one. And I think that uh, we've had some experiences where we, the parties couldn't agree to like a full Zoom trial because of due process issues. And I can certainly see that, that some parties 
feel like they need to be present in front of the judge that it's only fair for their client to get that get their day in court and are they really getting that via a zoom hearing um, that's why i think we're going to see continued sort of hybrid hearings but but probably not full zoom trials joe or janice do you have anything to add on in there you know, I mean, in that note, this is what I'd say. I think that sometimes when arbitrators, for example, in these hearings are sitting in their living room or in their kitchen and they're doing this proceeding, um, the solemnity of the event, you know, like my client might have lost their entire life savings. You know, some broker feels like he's being unfairly, you know, uh, complained against, whatever it may be. Um, you know, I had an experience where there was a lot of banter between a certain arbitrator and a certain counsel to the point where at some point my client was sort of hijacked into 45 minutes of this woman walking around her house to show the entire panel her Christmas decorations. 45 minutes, my clients had to smile when we're in this hotly contested case and their entire life savings you know, it's, it's hanging in the balance and we're, we all sitting here like I'm, I'm just, I couldn't believe it. I'm looking at all her Christmas decorations, you know, that shouldn't that, you know, I think this is a problem with people passively in their homes doing some of these virtual hearings. That's a great segue to our next slide, which is entitled FINRA virtual proceedings. And Rick, I thought maybe you could go through you know exactly how these proceedings are going to go forward um, as we go into the future. Let, let me just address because I think Janice made a really important point. And I always like to do a pitch. If you see an arbitrator doing something like that, um, doing a 45 minute demonstration of Christmas ornaments, please let us know so we can uh, counsel and or take other action regarding that behavior. And that's just not acceptable. And, and we um, our arbitrators are really good about filling out those uh, peer evaluations, but counsel are terrible about filling out the party evaluations. So please let us know as soon as, as, soon as it happens, because we can get involved in that right away. Anyway, in terms of the virtual proceedings, um, the, it, it really is the same in terms of the process. Um, what's different though, you probably never seen or rarely seen a FINRA uh, staff person attend the in-person hearings. It's very rare that we, we go in and, and sit there. Maybe we have a brand new chair or something. And we, uh, by that, I mean chairperson. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so I would say that what's big, you know, huge change is that we provide a tech support person or, or staff person in every single Zoom hearing on the merits. And that's the, so that they can do breakout sessions. They can do the, um, pull the arbitrators out and do deliberations or executive sessions. Um, and if there's something that goes wrong, staff's there to, to bring it back. Now, they may not be on screen. They're probably uh, turn their camera off, but all you have to do is call their name out and they'll be there in a flash. So take advantage of that resource. We can get you into breakout rooms. We can deal with uh, technology issues right away. Um, and I did want to mention, this is going a little off where you asked, Sean, but for hybrid hearings, um, for those of you who've been to our new space in New York, and so my, another tip is if you have a FINRA arbitration, don't go to One Liberty Plaza, you will be lonely. Um, we've moved to Brookfield Place. Uh, the 10th floor and the 12th floor have brand new, really high tech rooms where the cameras follow you, you have screens that you can upload your, your um, exhibits on, all kinds of great new technological advances. Uh, we don't yet have that in Boca, Chicago and LA. Um, but that's coming this summer, later this summer, maybe September. Um, and if you've been to our Jersey City location, um, that's another FINRA office, we have the same high-tech equipment that we have installed in New York. So I just wanted to mention that. And, and I think that's a good segue to our next section, which is about hearing prep. And I, I, we're gonna all kind of talk about some of the things you need to do to prepare your witnesses, whether it's witnesses or exhibits, uh, for your hearing prep. And I thought I'd start with you, Joe, and then I'd go to you, Paige, and then we kind of work around the room. So. Sure. I mean, any good trial lawyer knows that you're only as successful as the prep that you do in any kind of case. Um, and I think a lot of the mistakes, that, a mistake that's made a lot is that 
we prep people on Zoom because that's what they're going to be testifying to. Um, our witnesses are not as, as adept to this type of technology as perhaps we are. Now, on the respondent side, obviously, we have a lot of business people. Um, we're not talking about what I would call civilian witnesses or members of the public. But I think you, you never really get, a, as, as it is on the, on the deck here, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. What I like to do is my first initial contact with any witness, I use whatever technology makes them most comfortable. And like Rick says, we don't use the phone anymore. Well, if I've got a witness across the country, probably the first time that he or she's going to talk to me is by phone, just to get used to each other. Because people who are looking at the black box, are, I find, are definitely meter the way that they talk. They're not comfortable. They're afraid that somebody else is watching them, even though you tell them someone else is. So I like to have those conversations where we just kind of get to know each other um, and kind of feel each other out. And we build that rapport between the two of us where, you know, we're not hired directly by our, by our client, right? Claimants will pick who their lawyers are based on probably a number of different factors. Here, most professional witnesses, most in-house witnesses wind up coming to us through our clients. But I think building a rapport in a way that they're comfortable is important. And then and only then can we talk about prepping them through the technology. Before I put anybody on a camera, uh, after that first conversation, I send them documents in advance. And I ask them just to look through them, read them, get a sense of understanding them. And then only then do we bring the, uh, the technology in. Um, the second or third time around when we start talking about actually testifying as opposed to just talking about the case, what the documents are, we'll do that by Zoom again. Um, but, you, but you have to take people slowly. They are not as used to the technology as we are. So last and last but not least, of course, is um, everybody on Zoom, it's not, everybody on Zoom seems to think it's okay that everyone looks at the top of their head for the entire thing. No one cares what the lawyers, right? I, I'm hopeful the arbitration panel doesn't think twice about what I look like or where I'm staring or whether or not I'm taking notes. But I want my witness to look them in the eye. My witnesses, I prep them as best as I can to look at that camera right in the eye because if this were a jury trial, what do you tell witnesses? If it's a jury trial and you can trust them, you know, you ask that question and they turn and, and they talk to the jury panel. I tell the witnesses I think I can handle it is when I ask you a question, I want you looking that panel in the eye. So we do spend a lot of time on uh, screen etiquette and trying to get them used to looking into the, the black box as opposed to looking at themselves on the screen. I think, Sean, you mentioned in one of our prep sessions that when you're examining a witness, you should turn off your own camera so that you're not looking at yourself, you're actually looking at the witness. I think that's important. That, that actually does a lot to get rid of, you know, that tired feeling because when yeah. witnesses and even ourselves are looking at ourselves, we're judging ourselves constantly. And so, like, I turned off my camera before, so you guys, well, I turned it off so I can't see me. You guys can see me. That's what I meant, yeah. And, and it just makes it a lot easier. Uh, I don't worry about whether or not my hair is ugly or if my tie matches or things like that. Um, and because when you're, you know, when you're in the courtroom, right, you look how you look and you're very comfortable in your skin. But this medium changes that. So if you can get your witness to stop worrying about how they are looking and just concentrate on what they're comfortable with and what they know, they're going to do better. Paige, can you give us some uh, plaintiff's thoughts about prepping witnesses in this new virtual medium that we're all engaging in? Right. So I think it's it's just like Joe said, I think a lot of it is just sort of having them practice, having them comfortable with the technology. Some are much more adept at it than others. Um, for the most part, you know, we've always had depositions where they were looking into a camera. Um, but now, now it's a little bit different because they're kind of looking at this Brady Bunch screen. And like you said, do they do they look at themselves? Do they look at the attorney? Where, where do they look? So sort of getting them to understand where to look, how to respond, um, how to limit distractions to make sure they're in sort of a quiet place where they have a good connection. Um, and so we just we practice that and, and go through it a few times. If, if we if we need to do it several times, we do. Um, and, and sort of how to deal with if, if they're getting a document and they haven't seen it before, it's okay to take a break, to read it. 
if they're tired and they need to take a break because I'm not there. So it's harder for me to gauge. Is it, is it time for them? Do they need a break to, to say, you know, can, can we have a, can we have a little recess? Um, so I think all of those things, sort of the same things you would normally do, but, but then remembering that you won't be sitting there with them. So you've got to kind of anticipate what, what all could come up. I think that goes back to something Joe said before about the importance of some of those conversations before you even get onto the virtual medium. And I think now that we are um, no longer so restrictive about actually seeing each other face to face, to some extent, um, you might have witnesses who you know are gonna testify virtually because they are in one location, but it, in some ways I think it makes sense to go out and actually see them in person and get them to be comfortable with you before you turn around and put them on a screen and have them you know, broadcast from, let's say Detroit, Michigan down to Florida for an arbitration proceeding. And by spending those hours in person with them, getting them to understand what's going on, I, I just think it pays huge dividends. Uh, Janice, let's talk about exhibits again. You know, you were describing before, you know, your, how you put things together. But what do you do when you have your exhibits um, and you want a witness, though, to take time to actually see more than just that one piece of paper? And I'm talking about your witnesses now. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about witnesses you're cross-examining. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about what how you work with exhibits and how you prepare your witnesses to deal with the witnesses, the exhibits your adversaries are going to show them. Well, in part, you know, I really go through with the witness the importance of um, looking at the whole document, no matter what, no matter what, because you know, I, I always tell a story. I had a witness once that was getting grilled really hard, um, and you know, there were, it was this one question and the answer was on the second page, you know, and he just wouldn't look at the second page. I'm like, please just look at the second page, but I couldn't jump in and, you know, say, I need a break to talk to my client, to tell him to look at the second page, but, you know, so it's, it's, you know, and I tell my clients this story all the time. And he was like a, you know, he was a very well-educated person. I, you know, I, it, this stuff is hard, you know, it's, it's hard being a witness, being called on the spot, so I think you have to really, really prepare witnesses with the mechanics of things too, right? I will practice with them. Uh, thank you. Can you flip to the next page? You know, uh, I need to see the email from the back to the front. Uh, you know, I and and you have to, you know, this the first email may start on the second to last page. You know, and you go through this the logistical language to use uh, in part. But you also, you know, you know, you have to make sure, you know, that they understand the problems with the media medium, right? right? I mean, you don't want your client to be scared of it, but you also have to make sure that they don't, um, you know, do poorly because of it. Um, and you also have to make sure they don't have bloopers, you know, you know, even the mechanics of making sure the mute in the video is off when we have a break. You know, exchanging your cell phone number with the client so that on a break, if you need to speak to them, you know, or they have some issue or they want to have a break that they can, they're allowed to text, you know, you, you, you agree with your adversary, they're allowed to text, I need a break, you know, or right. something you, like that. If you have those ground rules set up beforehand, sure, absolutely. The rules are really important. I mean, the rules are just so important. It's really important to be organized and to have not only your adversary, uh, agreeing to the rules, but the panel, because you and your adversary could agree on something and the panel comes in, they're like, nope, we're not going to do it that way. We've decided we want it this way. And so, you know, I, I always say it's very important to put together a letter with your ad adversary saying, hey, this is the way we want to do things. If you're, you know, if you'd like us to do it a different way, please let us know in advance so we can be well prepared. And you'd never get a panel that wouldn't like to get a letter like that, you know. Um, so I, I do think that when it comes to documents, you really, really have to stress the importance of you know, reviewing them and, and the mechanics of how you're gonna do that. Absolutely. Roy, do you have any comments or thoughts about the use of, of exhibits in, in proceedings? Um, no, 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 nothing, nothing additional actually. I mean, I think we've kind of covered a lot of the key points that we've come across. And, you know, again, I think for um, you know my experience, it has been 
um, that point that you had on the slide, less is more, is really kind of takes on a little bit of a, of a, a heightened import here because because in presenting them, uh, you know, there's still a, a curve in learning and usage that I think sometimes it's helpful to get more out of more out of what you need to absolutely present. But beyond that, nothing else. I think after we get beyond exhibits, we should start talk with the few minutes we have left about witnesses and and how you deal with witnesses on screen. Paige, maybe you can start with like dealing with cross examining witnesses and what your bullet points would be in in what you want to do with an adverse witness. Right. So, I mean, I, I think it's not going to be really different doing it over Zoom than it would be doing it in any, any other setting. Um, I found I think it's it's pretty effective cross examination over Zoom. I haven't really found that that's been more difficult. Um, I don't know if others are are seeing that. I, I almost think that the direct is is a little more difficult over Zoom because you don't get sort of the back and forth, the, the sort of banter and the and walking along and telling the story. Cross examination, I think, is is a little bit easier through. I mean, it, of the two is the easier to do via Zoom. Is that, has that been other people's experience? I have to tell you, I have a little bit different experience. So when I cross-examine people in, in person, depending on who the witnesses is, I tend to move pretty quickly. I tend to try to keep them on their heels and I tend to bounce between subjects um, to keep them uncomfortable. Um, and, and I do most of the testifying myself so that their answers don't really matter. In Zoom, I do exactly the opposite because I need to make sure that the panel is listening to the question and that the client isn't getting confused or doesn't look like I'm confusing them. So with Zoom, I actually slow down and I'm much more deliberate with my questions so that they kind of sit for a second before the witness answers um, because of the lag in the, in the technology. So um, I, I, my experience is a little bit different, but that's the beauty of this practice, that everybody does things a different way. Um, but I find I have to slow down. I think it's important there to also, and, and it's for direct as well, but really focus on, you know, the real main points you want to make, because I think with Zoom, you are dealing with people who expect to be watching a show on TV, you know, and you've got whether it's the law and order, you know, the two minute summation or whatever, but I think the, the um, attention span is very different with watching this type of format and you really need to focus in on what are your main points. And it can't be one of those meandering cross examinations. Um, I think uh, as a uh, defense attorney, if somebody wants to come in and spend a whole day with my financial advisor on the, on the stand and go through all sorts of rules and regulations all day long, go for it because everybody in the room is going to fall asleep. <laughs> but if somebody comes in and they're focused and know and they can do a cross in an hour and make good points, that's something I've got to deal with. And, and that's important. So. That's something to consider. Direct examinations, as I, I agree with you, Paige, I think they're a lot harder on Zoom. And Joe, it's it's controlling that back and forth. And I think they need to do a lot of practice. And I, I find um, oftentimes defending financial advisors, sometimes it's hard to get them to want to practice a lot. It's, it's a struggle. <laughs> to me. So, There's a lot of denial in those prep sessions. Yeah. yeah, there is. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, and, and just on that point, I, I was just going to add, Sean, you know, especially in the regulatory context, it's, it's not an unbiased fact finder uh, doing the questioning in the investigative process. I mean, you know, generally the investigators coming in with a little bit of a slant and they're looking for reasons to not trust what's coming out of the witness's mouth or, or at least looking for indications that something they're saying is not trustworthy. And so I think it's really important, similar to the, the, the points you had on direct, which is, you know, training them to get, look at the camera and look straight into it. And it's so hard to do. I think I'm probably looking at the bottom corner of my screen because that's where your picture is. But it's really hard to get them to do that. And it's uber important where you have, it's always important in all contexts, but I think it's uber important where you got a regulator who's coming in, you know, looking for any indications of what, what direction are they looking at with their eyes or whatever maybe um, I think I think getting them prepared and screen testing them ahead of time is super important. Absolutely and on that note it's two o'clock 
The second word is baseball, October baseball. Um, and we hope that everybody has enjoyed this. Uh, there is one question that just came up on chat. Um, oh, oh, somebody asked if proceedings could be recorded. Um, you know, generally it depends on the forum and the and the agreement among the parties. So thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure seeing your smiley faces on this screen. And uh, somebody asked for me to repeat the words, October baseball. There we go. Take care.